All right, folks, it's 1.30, and we'll uh, get back on business. Uh, we have the special meeting item that we heard just before lunch, and uh, the sponsors will uh, not only sponsor and uh, address that issue, I've given the cards to my colleague, uh, Member Chavez, and he will uh, do this part of the meeting. The floor is yours. Thank you, President. So just for the record and for the public that's here, I want to clarify that we pulled back the initiation of the amendment and replaced it with a general plan uh, review committee, the establishment of a general plan review committee that will be comprised of 17 uh, members, two of them uh, chosen by each council member and then three chosen by the mayor. Um, and I just want to go over a little bit of background for that because I've gotten a couple of emails and calls from folks on why are we doing this now? Um, we just got through with the last general plan amendment. Uh, so I want to give a little bit of background. Um, and first of all, I think there's a perception that a general plan uh, is just about housing, and it's not. It's essentially a vision, uh, of a mission statement of the city of Fresno that was put together by the council cohort uh, five years ago and the former mayor uh, and adopted. And to me, this is one of the most important conversations that a city council uh, can have. And there are two uh, issues that the city deals with that are 100% exclusive to uh, the council. One is land use, and the other one is budget. And so the number one question that I've gotten had been, why now? What is the reason for us doing this? And what I want to point out for the record is that this is actually written into our policy. Anybody can go and check section 12-3, actually reads, and I want to read the quote for you. It says, the city will reevaluate the general plan every five years using information from, but not limited, to market demand studies and analysis to determine land use needs. So, in background of that, the last time we went through this, taxpayers spent over $3 million to develop a plan half a decade ago. And so I think it's only fair that we ask the question and it says, what did those taxpayers get for that amount of money that was spent? So let's look at Southeast Fresno. Let's look at Southwest and Northwest and what it looked like five years ago. And let's cross reference to what it looks like today. And equally as important, and I think this is going to be a, a, a big perspective and approach that I have, is we also need to look at what Madera is doing what Clovis, what Kerman, what Sanger, and Fowler look like. Because I'm going to be presenting some uh, information on, on what their development has looked like since we adopted our plan. And let me just state for the record that there were some accomplishments that were delivered by the current general plan. Uh, we actually secured over $20 million for uh, Fulton Street and the revitalization uh, 40 plus million dollars for our bus rapid transit system that runs along the corridors, uh, new restaurants in downtown, uh, but we also have to look at what did it not deliver as well. And in my opinion, we should have performance measures built into the general plan and revise those on a yearly basis. Where are we at with housing? Where are we at with transportation? Where are we at with parks? Where are we at with a whole list of other amenities that the city of Fresno is responsible for. And to me, that's what this process will do. It'll highlight uh, what worked and then also revamp what did not work. And for the record, I want to make sure that folks understand that we're not advocating or proposing leapfrog development. It's not about sprawl. It's about smart growth and, uh, and a formula that actually includes a and takes a theoretical concept that's written into a plan and actually puts a funding mechanism so that it's, it pays for itself long term. That's what I'm going to be focusing on. I remember actually sitting on this dais and the conversation uh, during the general plan. I sat on the South Fresno downtown uh, specific component of that. And so I remember those conversations and everything that was promised. And if you look at the breakdown of where we landed with this, it was supposed to be 60% infill, 40% growth. Um, and it was uh, supposed to reduce, if you recall, vehicle miles travel. That was the, one of the big selling points that we wanted to accomplish. And it would facilitate development where residents could, and I quote, work, live, and play. 
That was the exact phrase that was used during that, that process. But the reality is that we've struggled to deliver housing across the spectrum, whether it's market rate, mid-range, affordable, and we see rents going up across the city of Fresno. We used to be a very affordable city. If you look back 10, year, 10 12 years ago, some of you folks might remember the banners that were outside of apartment complexes that said, three months rent free if you sign a lease. Now you're lucky to find a one bedroom, one bath, and if you do, it's usually in the upwards of $1,000. So when you look at the supply of housing in the city it has, that has not kept up with the growing population, that's the result. And I said this at a forum the other day. I said this, this housing crisis that we have is it literally a problem we can build ourselves out of. So I want to share some data from folks. And this is from, again, from our own general plan. The city of Fresno is projected by our own estimates to grow by 221,000 residents in the next 20 years. That's by 2040. That's 11,000 people every single year for the next 20 years. So what does our, our data show? Our data shows that our building activity has actually de decreased drastically from a high of 3,270 in 2015 when the plan was adopted to the subsequent year in 2016 of 1,257. 1,467 in 2017, and then last year, it was only 1,337 building permits. So when you look at that data and you cross-reference that with our growing population, something's not quite right. Construction did not just freeze. We know that it still occurred, but it occurred on the even more outskirts of Fresno. You look at uh, the developments that's happened away from our core. Madera has a projected new city of 120,000 people that is literally 14.5 miles away from the core of Fresno. And when I say core of Fresno, I'm not talking about across the river from them. I'm talking about downtown, southwest, southeast, the core of the, of the city. So we look at those, at those stats, and you look at what development's been lost to Clovis, Kerman, Fowler, Sanger. That's why we see these huge bottlenecks of traffic. And if you don't believe me, at 7 a.m. and 5 p.m., you see this huge influx of traffic coming into the city of Fresno, our core. And you have folks that live in Madera that now have to travel 14 miles to get to work. Folks that live in Sanger that now have to travel 8.5 miles to get to work. And folks that live in Kerman that have to travel the same distance. So one of the primary reasons why we did this was to reduce vehicle miles traveled. We've actually increased that from folks that work here in downtown at the core of the city. And now what we essentially did is we formed bedroom communities from folks that come from outside work here and then come 5 p.m., they're out of here. So to me, that's lost revenue for the city of Fresno. And one of the biggest eye-opening experiences for me has been when I'm trying to lure uh, retailers and shops to come here. Companies like Nordstrom Rack or Macy's. The first question they ask me is, how much discretionary spending does that area have where you're trying to locate these amenities? And I share the market research that we've done with them. So in my opinion, we've essentially traded white flight for wealth flight. Folks that have the discretionary spending and are moving out of Fresno. And look, I'm gonna present the data as we go through this conversation, but I wanna remind folks that again, we, we um, pulled back the initial uh, amendment and we're gonna set up the review committee, which I know will be a very robust uh, community outreach uh, process. Uh, I was here when we did this last time and I think the city of Fresno deserves to have that conversation because this council cohort was essentially outline what Fresno will look like for the next 20, 25 years. I wholeheartedly uh, believe that. So my hope is that we can at least stop some of that flight from leaving the city of Fresno because as we all well know, the folks that live across the river in Madera, they're not gonna come downtown. They're gonna go to River Park, which nothing wrong with River Park. Nothing wrong with River Park, but I would like for those folks to actually support the core city, which is what we have, a home that I've had for 25 years here in Southeast Fresno. And so with that, I'd like to make the motion to establish the General Plan Review Committee. They will come back in six months, and they will give us their input, and at that point, we'll make a decision along with 
uh, a funding source for having this um, conversation for, for our community. Um, and I, I wanna close with, with this. I think in the, in the conversation that we have about general plans, uh, there was a lot of work that was done. I myself did many of that work that you see here, but there has to come a point where we actually pair a funding formula to a theoretical concept, because as we all know, a booklet's not gonna build multifamily housing. It's not gonna build condos. It's not gonna build tiny homes or prefab homes. And for me, we need to put everything on the table because we have some new requirements that have come down as well. Many, when we did this plan, we did not have or were entrusted with um, SIGMA, which is the Groundwater Management Act. Now we do. Now that's gonna be a more robust conversation. I hope that we can get some assistance from the state to where we can actually engage in regional planning so that we're not all just doing this piecemeal. That would be ideally the, the best situation. Given the circumstances that we have, I think for us it merits to have a conversation about what Fresno looks like and the investments that we will be making as a council cohort. Um, and uh, I definitely would appreciate um, my colleagues supporting establishing the review committee and then having this conversation in uh, six months. And so with that, I'll make the motion to establish the committee. Seconded by Member Carabasi. Uh, Member Chavez, you're doing such a good job. If we don't take it out to the public and review those cards, that'd be uh, most helpful. Sure. Got a list of um, a lot of a lot of cards, uh, President. Oh, Council Member Carabasi. If I can add, um, you know, we had an issue on the agenda earlier um, regarding the convention center, and there were a lot of rumors out there. There were a lot of confusion out there, and I just want to make one thing very clear. This is going to be one of the most important votes I ever take as a council member because this is going to have severe implications on how the quality of life in Fresno. Um, and I'm very proud to work with my colleagues on this matter because we had a citizen-driven general plan. And it started with the citizens. And this review is going to start with the citizens. We actually don't have a choice. We are required under our general plan, like my colleague said. We are required to have a review because market conditions change. The priorities change. Like we said, we have a real need for housing and all kinds of housing, uh, not just single family, but multifamily, affordable housing, market rate housing. But we have to have this discussion. Um, I'm very concerned about the general fund. I want to make sure because a lot of our income as a city is not just sales tax revenue, it's property tax revenue. So I want to make sure that we are no longer losing out economic opportunity to our neighboring communities like Clovis and Madera and Sanger and Selma and Kingsburg. Because, like he's, again, that creates more pollution and that, that doesn't help our community. Um, so I hope that we can start this conversation. That's all we're doing today. Starting a conversation with a citizen-led committee uh, where we will appoint members and the mayor will appoint three. And that's it. Whatever else you've heard about us making an amendment, that's not happening today. This is going to start with our citizens and it's going to end with our citizens. Thank you. All right. So with that, we'll uh, take it out to the public. And first up, we have Grecia Elenes with the Leadership Council. And then after her will be uh, Kimberly McCoy with Building Healthy Communities. Is Grecia? She stepped out. Okay, we'll put her aside because she's going to want to speak. Kimberly uh, McCoy, if you could just please state your name and address for the record, please. Oh, you guys don't want me to make comments. Oh, there we go. go. <laughs> Kimberly McCoy, my address is 3138 West Santa Ana and precinct can't remember my precinct number right now, but in District 1. <laughs> this council should establish an implementation committee, which is diverse and include involvement from community-based organizations, community residents, and businesses in the area, just like any other implementation committee that has been established. The priorities of the general plan is to ensure investment in older and disadvantaged neighborhoods. 
The implementation committee should follow the outline for the general plan that was approved five years ago. Community residents and leaders worked hard on the general plan to ensure that their voices were heard on how they would like their city developed, and that is something that this council should honor and commit to doing. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Nathan Ali with the Fresno Chamber. Aubrey. Good afternoon, Council President and members of the Council. My name is Aubrey Willis, and I'm the Government Affairs Manager over at the Chamber of Commerce. So on behalf of our 1,200 members who employ over 78,000 workers across our area, I speak today in support of the item sponsored by Council Members Chavez and Carbasi, along with Vice President Arias, and appreciate them bringing this issue to the table. Like many in the room today, the Chamber has noticed the growth in communities such as Clovis, other outlying areas in Fresno County, and Southern Madera County that far outpaces the growth in Fresno. As California continues to struggle with a massive housing shortage, it is imperative we make sure our general plan allows us to meet the housing needs of our community and stimulate economic growth in all areas of our city while preventing Fresno from falling victim to the astronomically rising housing prices in other parts of the state. The Chamber is not advocating for a specific change to the general plan at this time. We feel the process must play out, allowing for input from all the sectors of our community, including the business community, residents, and other interested parties. However, we agree with the authors that the time is right to begin the conversation and look forward to participating in a general plan review process. We urge the council to unanimously support the proposed general plan implementation review committee committee and begin this important work. Thank you. Thank you. Next up we have Keith uh, Woodcock and after that we'll have Kyle Lopez Schmidt. Mr. Keith Woodcock or Kyle. Kyle you're up. I think that might be Keith Bergthal with Metro Ministries. He's um, out doing other business. Um, Kyle Lopez Schmidt, uh, Community Vision Capital and Consulting. Um, like to speak to this from the perspective of a citizen that was on the general plan committee. Um, I think there's a little bit of uh, historical rewriting that through that experience, um, there was this really robust community engagement that happened in the general plan. There was also a very aggressive approach on single-family housing developers part to undermine what the community was asking for and I think that's an important part of the historical record and um, kind of an important part of why uh, in the context of this general plan bring, being brought back that citizen-led groups and individuals like myself that have been working hard on um, affordable housing development and community development that are concerned that the people that are really spurring this and the people that have the most of your attention are single family housing developers that have a great deal to gain by adding to the uh, sphere of influence to the city of Fresno, while this community has a great deal to lose by um, a continued lack of focus on the, um, the center of the city, bringing back neighborhoods, focusing on um, building up the revenues to really have actual maintenance of our city streets, actual um, construction and maintenance of our city's parks that those things are really difficult to do if you do not constrain um, the growth of the city because the further the city grows, the, le the less dense that the city is, the more difficult it is for those revenues to um, repair historical disinvestment in our city center. And without um, starting to rectify that situation, acknowledging it, and really investing in the city center, we are not going to solve this problem by doing the same thing as the past. We're not going to build up an economy in, in our city by continuing to only build single family residential. We need to really focus on a diversity of housing options, increasing density, increasing um, job opportunities in the city center, and um, we're going to do that by can starting to manage the growth of our um, single family housing on the fringe of the city, and that's the way we'll get there. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, John and Dara, followed by 
Nyla Zender. John and Dara. One once. Nyla Zender. Zender. Good afternoon. My name is Nyla Zender, and I live at 1523 West Robinwood Lane, Fresno, 93711. I'm a member of the League of Women Voters and serve on the Affordable Housing Committee. The League has been a strong supporter of the current general plan update done in 2014, just five years ago. We approve the procedures and processes followed on producing the update. For example, a 17-member Citizens Advisory Committee was formed to gain input from the public. One of our League members served as co-chairperson for the group that held 18 meetings and offered many ideas for the plan that were actually heard by the people in charge. There were 14 public information meetings held in various areas of the city to inform citizens and hear their responses. We are strong supporters of public input and the general plan, uh, the previous general plan update allowed for that to happen and encouraged it. The city also reached out for grant money to do the general plan. They got federal grants including the U.S. Department of Energy under their energy efficiency and conservation block grant program, and HUD, Sustainable Community Initiative. They also received from the state of California the California Strategic Growth Council Sustainable Communities Grant funding. Now, some of these grants were provided to integrate long-term community sustainability principles and practices into land use planning and zoning in Fresno. The League supports maintaining the current sphere of influence and focusing on developing and upgrading neighborhoods, as well as in downtown and along transit corridors. There's available land in Fresno that can be used to provide more housing. The general plan encourages all of these ideas we do not need to expand the sphere of influence when there is land available within the city for development. According to the city planning staff, a total of 289,159 housing units can be built on that available land. And that's within the current sphere of influence. Even if developers prefer large areas of vacant land for their purposes, Sprawl is what can impact land designated for agriculture, for one thing, and also leads to the city's budget problems. Building new infrastructure is costly, and these developments do not generate the taxes required. Also, when people move to areas of sprawl, the old neighborhoods suffer. The general plan directs the city to grow up, not out. We have an excellent general plan designed with good principles and incorporate long-term vision, and we need to give it time. Five years is not long enough. If indeed uh, we have not seen the number of housing starts as were projected, it is not the fault of the general plan. Rather than spending several years and a few million dollars on a general plan review committee, investigating another update, we need to ask the city, we need to ask the city council to put its strength and energy in the implementation of the current plan. Thank you. Thank you. Joe White. Thank you so much for having me. I represent, uh, my name is Joe White. I live at 3263 East Kirkhoff. I'm a neighbor of Luis. 
and uh, I represent the Jackson neighborhood, uh, just east of downtown. And uh, I'd just like to communicate on behalf of my neighbors that uh, in the last four listening sessions that we've held in our neighborhood, about 33% of the neighborhood, our, our neighbors are asking for more affordable housing options closer to where they already live. Uh, they're not asking to go to the outskirts. They uh, would like to see the nine vacant lots that we have in our neighborhood built on. Uh, they're ready. They're, they, they want that. Um, but in addition to that, our neighbors also recognize that kind of psycho from a psychological perspective, it sounds a lot like build, building wealthy neighborhoods for wealthier people. And, uh, and our neighbors don't like how that sounds. In fact, they feel empowered by a general plan that uh, seems to just suggest that infill and uh, building close to where people already live is the priority. Uh, and, then, and then lastly, if, if, uh, if my neighbors were here today, they would want to say that um, if we're going to if we're going to talk about resolutions and committees and uh, and uh, review committees and all this, like let's let's deal with facts, and that that I believe takes uh, more time, uh, and and so if we if we do a review committee, let's look at actual facts, let's take the time to look at those facts, uh, and let our neighbors be a part of the process. Thanks so much. Thank you, Joe. I'm going to do a second call for uh, Grecia Elenis. Keith Berhold told me he was actually not going to be here, but we got his letter uh, for the record. Uh, second call for Mr. John Indara. John Indara. Eddie Burgos. Eddie Burgos from Numskull Productions. That's what it says, guys. It says, it says Numskull Productions. Okay. Seems legit. Uh, Jason uh, Lawton. Mr. Lawton, you're back. I am back, uh, but th those, that card, uh, Eddie Nemskulls, that's actually for the next one on the next agenda. If oh, you look at the oh okay. On there. Uh, same with Chris Miller. Uh, there might be a couple other ones on there. So you didn't want to speak on this? Nope. Side of, okay, we'll save, Except we'll for save good this luck. on the side. Got it. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Ivanka Saunders. Welcome. Hello, good afternoon, President and Council Members. My name is Ivanka Saunders, address 764 P Street, Fresno, California. I'm a policy coordinator with Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability. I would like to make a comment as it relates to this item for a general plan review committee. Regardless of how the city decides to move forward on this item today, please ensure that the city is complying with its own policies that are currently in place. I'm sharing with you the language of the city of Fresno's housing element. Um, this is part of um, the Housing Element Program 27, in which a general plan implementation committee was supposed to have convened in early 2017, and that committee would have opportunities to provide annual recommendations to the city on its prioritizations of future investments. This is yet to occur, so thank you for now complying with Program 27 if you decide to create a committee to review the general plan. It would also cover that. Program 27 states that the general plan implementation committee must include a diverse cross-sector involvement from the private sector, including developers, community organizations, as well as other relevant public institutions to review progress on the priorities established in the general plan to invest in an older to invest in older and disadvantaged neighborhoods and continue to refine and review city policy and practices to ensure investments and policies are furthering the goals of the plan 
it is important to respect the time and investment by community members, stakeholders, and city staff that has been put into the recently established specific plans within the general plan. As we continue to review the general plan, please continue to publicly engage the community and ensure that the city staff and the implementation review committee have clear direction that their analysis should focus on how effective the general plan has been to reinvest equitably and reinvigorate established neighborhoods. Also, besides Program 27 of the housing element, there are still several other housing element programs that are relevant to the general plan that are not being implemented, and some initiatives should be taken by this council to help ensure that we're meeting the housing needs of all Fresno residents. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, last one I have is Mr. Radley Reap, visiting us from Clovis. Welcome. Thank you so much. Councilman Chavez, members of the council, my name is Radley Reap and I reside at 557 West Escalon in Clovis. I know I'm not a Fresno City resident, but as you know, General plans have far-reaching effects, and there needs to be coordination between all entities. There are two things I'd like to, to do. Uh, one is to ask you a favor. Mr. Chavez, if you would explain to the people who have not had a chance yet to see the amended um, agenda item for today, how are members of the public going to interact with the committee? Are there going to be public meetings, workshops? And so that hasn't been said yet orally, and I don't know if it's written out or not. If you would say something about that, and I'll let you do that in just a second. But the second thing is this. I'm not sure all of you are aware, but in 2020, Fresno County is probably going to update its general plan, make the final update. And that's going to be from the year 2020 to the year 2040. I didn't hear anybody mentioning about coordinating with the county so that the plans work together. I'd like you to address what you think is going to happen in that regard. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Yes, these meetings will be uh, public, uh, publicly noticed, and this will be the beginning of a very robust uh, community outreach uh, plan. Uh, I think what you will see is, and myself having gone through a specific plan in the last uh, 18 months, uh, very diverse um, with members that are stakeholders in our community, um, and that's the kind of process that we're going to mirror for, for this process. And then to your second point, um, absolutely, I think the city of Fresno uh, needs to work and extend that branch out to the county, to the, to the surrounding cities. Uh, often things we, oftentimes we do things in silos, uh, but that's going to be um, more of a, of a broader conversation for regional planning. Uh, it's been tried in the past, um, and being very upfront, Clovis hasn't been very amenable to that uh, recently because they have their own interests. The city of Fresno uh, does as well, but we need to start thinking regionally about this metropolitan area uh, that we have, and I think you'll see that be part of this conversation that we're um, hopefully beginning uh, today. Thank you. All right, those were all the cars that we have. Uh, President, uh, oh, one more car. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Christine Barker, and uh, my permanent address is 1533 East Calamerna, Fresno, California, 93710, which I believe makes me in uh, Mr. Bredefield's district. Uh, I uh, <laughs> am here today because I am excited about an implementation committee. I think that's important, and I'm really worried that the last minute uh, resolution that I read this morning uh, makes it sound like a general plan update is the automatic um, resolution of having a committee meet twice a month for six months. Um, and I think there's a lot of room for implementation for of the existing general plan. I don't think we have done enough yet as a city to actually implement what we've got. Uh, and a general plan update is an extensive, expensive process uh, that will, if, from my perspective, and I'm not a lawyer, uh, if you are already decided that you're going to expand the sphere of influence, 
then of course you need a general plan update because of course you need an environmental impact review. If you are interested in implementing the plan we have and seeing what's working and what's not, then you don't need to include language in this resolution about finding money in a budget um, for something that's already been decided to happen. Let, uh, I encourage you to have a public process, to listen to your residents, to get real data on what is and isn't working in the current plan. And uh, it's really worrisome that you've already decided you need money for a general plan update. Thanks. Have a great day. <laughs> Thank you, Christine. Uh, now we'll open it up to the general public. If anybody wishes to speak that hasn't filled out a card, now is the time. So, seeing that, nobody? Oh, one more. Candidate for mayor's office, Brian Jefferson. Um, <clears throat> 825 West Princeton Ave. Um, I think that uh, it should also be more transparent for the general public to, to know more about um, the plans for development you know, in the process and, and knowing that they can come down here to the, to the planning department and development department or, or the city clerk's office and, 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 and pick up these pamphlets, you know, that, that have either the decisions or the determinations for, for all these different plans and things that are, that are going on right before their eyes right here in city council meetings that they may or may not be able to speak on because they have no idea what it is when it's being you know, uh, uh, brought before them in cold language, you know, uh, uh, legal, legal verbiage for one, uh, uh, maybe, maybe codes, you know. Um, I, I just like to see more transparency all the way across the board because as a candidate, you know, I'm required to, to, to be as transparent as possible and, and I'm trying my, my darnest to do just that. And I feel like, you know, if we quit concealing facts and, and the facts that some of us are, are, are being manipulated or, 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 or <clears throat> otherwise swayed it, you know, by popular votes or popular contributors, you know, or supporters to, to our own individual ideas of gain as opposed to the overall city of Fresno and its residents, you know, ideals and views and and perspectives. That's what I had to say. Thank you for hearing me out, Council. Thank you. Um, Ma'am, you wanted to speak? If you could just state your name and uh, address for the record, please. My name is Amanda Castro. My permanent address is 1309 West Browning Avenue. Um, I'm actually a student at Fresno State studying city and regional planning. So it is very um, interesting to me to see these kind of things unfold. And um, just from a historical perspective, um, you know, from things that we've been studying, expanding the sphere of influence has often caused a lot of unintended consequences. And I feel like that's something that we should consider really consider, you know, with this committee. And like you had said, this committee is going to be um, part stakeholders in Fresno. I'd kind of like to know exactly who that is, just because we know that there are some developers, you know, who have quite some influence in Fresno. And, you know, it'd be interesting to see if they would be on that committee, probably, you know, in creating any type of biases, anything like that. But at just the surface level, I feel like expanding is not a good um, solution, solution to a problem that we have here in Fresno. We have vacant buildings that are burning down here in Fresno that's become a problem for our already stretched thin fire department. Expanding them into somewhere else, we're not, you know, is not even addressing the what we have here. So that's all I'd like to say from a young person's perspective, a student's perspective, um, Fresno citizens' perspective. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Anybody else would like to speak that had, had an opportunity to fill out a card? Seeing none, we'll bring it back up to the dais. Uh, do we have any council colleagues punched up? Council Member Arias. Thank you, Council Member Chavez. Just want to give the audience a, a little bit of background what's happened since the general plan 
was approved in 2014. Since then, the Southwest Pacific Plan has been approved. The West Area Plan has been completed and we're going through the ERR process now. The Southeast Pacific Plan is under development. The South Central Pacific Plan is under development with the ER commencing soon, which calls for thousands of new acres of industrial development in South Fresno. Um, at the same time, we're in the middle of negotiating our tax sharing agreement with the County of Fresno that determines our ability as a city to afford every time, uh, to afford our ability to afford uh, to provide services every time we annex new property into the city. We also uh, made reference to the general plan of the county coming up for 2020 and the renewal of Measure C that provides uh, billions of dollars um, over time to build out freeways and streets in our city. They will be going up for renewal in 2022. Additionally, some new environmental justice rules and laws and guidance has been passed at the state level. New rules on groundwater management has passed and put, been put in place by the state because of the overpumping. And most importantly, we've seen the development of a housing crisis. Um, I have seen as a member of the public, past council members and supervisors and others scream at the idea that when we built infill development, it cost between 350,000 to up to half a million per, per unit. And they argue that we shouldn't be doing that because it's so costly. Um, I've also seen the huge calls that are imposed into anybody who wants to do infill development. If you want to build an apartment complex in infill area, they make you upgrade the whole infrastructure for the whole block, which results in a 350000 to half a million dollar per unit cost per door. If you want to build infill development in the city of Fresno, it takes longer to get to the city planning process than it would to do sprawl and open land. The cost of infill is real. Infill development is far more expensive. It's far more difficult and lengthy to get through it. And every department in this city imposes their wish list of things that were delayed maintenance by this city for decades. In, in short, we also have county residents who come to us every council meeting asking not to be annexed into the city even though subdivisions have been built around them. Requesting that we connect them to sewer, to water, because their water wells have run dry, but not require them to connect to a sewer system. We have county residents asking us to um, create another county island or peninsula around them. We have county residents and city residents complaining of the bottlenecks that exist west of the 9-9 because we're surrounded by two and three acre parcels of county residents that don't want to sell their property to a developer who wants to build infill or to anyone. We were given a very clear and ambitious goal in the last general plan, build infill. But the tools were not put in place to allow us to do it effectively. We're also going to have to wrestle with a public safety or parks tax asking our voters to tax themselves more money to pay, per, to pay for police and fire and parks at the same time that we still waive impact fees for police, fire, and parks at times for companies who want to locate in Fresno, for companies who want to expand in Fresno. We find ourselves contradicting ourselves on a daily basis. What county residents want versus what city residents want what the Board of Supervisors wants to pay for, what costs they want to keep versus what the city wants. In this last expansion where we brought in Amazon and Ulta, the most financial benefit besides the jobs that were created was to the County of Fresno. The city residents are giving tax rebates annually to those companies. These are all realities that we have to tackle and I'm supportive of doing this review because we can't kick the can down the road anymore. Things were committed to, aggressive goals were set, and as much as some folks may not like developers, you should know, I spent 10 times more of my 
time as a council member talking to folks who want more infill or who want us to fill, fix the problems that sprawl didn't, uh, that created, or to build sidewalks in schools that have been annexed 75 years ago into a city but never had sidewalks built. Roads in South Fresno that are third world country conditions. Then I deal with developers who want to sprawl. But there is a balance that we have to reach. And I think this committee, whoever is interested, from my perspective, you, if you want to be appointed to this committee in my district and represent my district, be ready to do a lot of work, have very hard conversations, and be dissatisfied that one way isn't the only answer for the uh, future of Fresno. You will have to struggle with the same things that we struggle with on a daily basis. What people want versus what they're willing to pay for. What developers want versus what they're willing to pay for. What government officials want versus what they're willing to ask people to pay for. Um, so with that, I'm supportive of this because it's a necessary process, not only outlined by the general plan, but outlined by the fact that we have a housing crisis. And if we're going to really prioritize info development, we have to be willing to put up the money. Thank you. Councilmember Carbasi, followed by Councilmember Esparza. I want to thank the Vice President uh, for his comments. Um, you know, I view the general plan as a living document. When this plan was created, our market and our economy was in a very bad place. And fortunately, based on metrics, things are doing better. Uh, but the reason why we have these updates is because the market changes. And it's really easy to create a document and have all these ideals, and that's wonderful. But you can't always deliver on ideals. The seven of us up here have a responsibility to make sure we can deliver based on facts and how the plan is actually being implemented. Some interesting comments were made. And by the way, the public comments really do help us. Nothing has been decided. That's why this is being put out to the public. And that's why there are going to be public meetings. I was very lucky as a resident of Northwest Fresno to attend the West Area Steering Committee meetings because we have a community called Forgotten Fresno. And that's in my district, Councilmember Soria's district, Councilmember uh, Vice President Arias's district. And you had a lot of frustrated people that felt like they weren't included. But we had public meetings in multiple, where translation was available in Hmong and in uh, Punjabi and English and Spanish. And people were able to participate in the process. And that's what we want to have here. Nothing's been decided. No one is pulling our strings. We want to be accountable to the people, and that's what we're going to do. So we need your help too, though, because it's really easy to say, oh, developers are you know, pulling the strings here. That's not what's happening. If you participate and you're willing to do the hard work like you're doing today, we're going to have, a, we're going to have recommendations that keep all the great things in our current plan and help us do things to really prop up this plan and to help infill and all kinds of development and do it the smart way. Someone made a comment about building in wealthy neighborhoods. I, I know that is a popular perception, but that's not what smart growth is. Um, and that's not what we're trying to do here today. Thank you. Thank you. As the, uh, as the council member who represents the only landlocked district in our city, district number seven, uh, with the highest rate of poverty and, and highest rate of dilapidated infrastructure in our city, uh, I have to remain uh, wary, wary of any policy or potential course of action that could ultimately you know, end up harming our existing neighborhoods uh, and continue to leave them behind. And I know folks are frustrated with the, the lack of growth we've experienced under the new uh, plan, the, the five-year-old plan. Um, and I agree, we do have a problem. Uh, but the problem, in my, from my perspective, is not the actual plan. Uh, the problem is that we have a whole crop of elected leaders, uh, both past and present, uh, who have really failed to put their back uh, into making this plan a reality. Um, if you want to know what I inherited uh, when I stepped into office uh, on Blackstone, I inherited a Popeyes, uh, Blackstone and Cornell. And two blocks south of that, we have a Burger King going up. And I mean, that is literally and figuratively garbage. Uh, garbage development uh, for the Blackstone corridor, uh, a place that holds so much promise uh, here in our city. So down, not just Blackstone, but also downtown, uh, Ventura, Kings Canyon. Uh, these may represent the past of our city, uh, but they also represent the, the future of our city. Uh, and so I think what we should be doing right now is doubling down uh, on this plan instead of retreating from it. Uh, and that's why you know, I, I think I might suggest some language uh, about the scope of this committee that really limits the work to 
how we fulfill uh, what we have here in the in the current plan, um, and, and potentially based on one of our speakers' suggestions, uh, look at striking the funding, uh, the last sentence of the amendment, <clears throat> the last sentence of the actual resolution. To me, that the general plan is is a long term value statement. Uh, you know, very similar to how we conduct the budget every June. Uh, that's sort of a short term statement of our values of our city. I think the, the general plan is kind of that long term version uh, of those values. Uh, and that's why, you know, what I'll be doing, notwithstanding what happens here uh, today, is uh, very early next year I'm going to bring forward legislation that actually helps uh, the cause, helps uh, fulfill uh, the current general plan, and it's consistent with that vision. Uh, I'm bringing forward. Uh, tax increment financing, financing mechanisms uh, in the form of enhanced infrastructure financing districts and or uh, community revitalization uh, investment authorities, uh, to be specific. Uh, so I'd like to offer up those uh, amendments in terms of striking that, uh, that sentence about the identifying the funding uh, and also limiting the scope to looking at this committee just looking at how do we uh, take our general plan and actually fulfill it. Because again, I'll, I'll reinforce I don't think there are too many folks here in this building that have really uh, put the effort into fulfilling this vision. Council, oh, yeah. I actually do applaud your comments, and you're probably most impacted by this, and I agree with that. And if it's okay, um, Council Member, um, the reason why I'm gonna ask not to do that is because we want this to be an open process for the public. We don't wanna handcuff this committee. That way they can do what's necessary, but, I do think it's important that they understand that they do have that option to keep doing, keep the good parts of the plan. But if we handcuff the committee, we're effectively telling them, this is all you can do. And a review process should be open to all options on the table. And I do encourage, and I will do anything I can to support you and support your district in this process to make sure that District 7 is represented and not left behind. So you do not accept the, uh, the amendments, the amendments to strike the, uh, so, you, you're not open to revising the scope. Are you open to striking the last sentence about the funding? If we do that, then we're telling them, we want you to put all this time and effort into working on this, and any recommendations you have, there's not going to be any funding secured. That's my only concern. If my colleague wants to comment on that, again, I don't want to handcuff the committee. Well, I mean, I, I think funding is always going to be an issue in whatever we do. I mean, I, I think uh, if we really were to dig in, just from my perspective, looking at the lack of progress in our general plan, I mean, one big issue within infield development is this, we as a city have failed to invest in the infrastructure um, uh, to make it possible so, so that we can avoid uh, these ridiculously high or per door costs uh, on these projects. Um, so I, I offered the amendments and it's up to you to, uh, to accept or not. No, uh, Council Member Soria, she's been very patiently waiting. Thank you, so I just have a few comments and I appreciate you know the folks from the public um, residents that came to weigh in on what we have um, before us and you know I want to echo just a couple of the comments that were made by some of my co um, some of my colleagues and I think that one of the issues and I've you know myself and council member Caparelli are kind of the ones that have been here now the longest were the 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 veterans here. Um, but one of the issues that I have seen and what we do have to also include as part of um, having this review, I'm not opposed to it, but we really have to have an honest conversation also about our planning department and the time and, um, you know, the issues with efficiency and permitting process. Because I will tell you that one of the biggest frustrations for me has been that my office has had to handhold a lot more in the last few years than before. And so when we're talking about permit, you know, permits being pulled or development not have, happening as, as fast, I hear you know, every, every other day, well, it takes so long in Fresno that we'd rather go to Fres um, Clovis and Madeira. And so we have to have a broad conversation about the types of resources that we do have readily available to make sure that not only are, do we have the resources to, for infrastructure and those types of investments that are gonna track the development, but that we also have the capacity within our planning department because if 
the demand for permits increase, we have to make sure that our planning department is staffed up um, to meet those demands. The other thing that I will say, um, because I've been a big supporter and have led efforts to try to revitalize some of the infill areas, it takes a long time to put a development um, together for when it's related to affordable housing because of some of the issues that were highlighted earlier, the cost. Um, so if any of you guys have driven up Blackstone and McKinley, um, you guys are seeing um, some demolition happening. And so there's actually going to be an 88 housing unit, mixed use uh, affordable housing development that's going to come in that area. I will tell you guys that I started working on that project six months into office. And so five years later, that's how long it has taken. So this project won't even be built until probably finished being built until next year. There, the, the amount of time it took to put the funding streams together, the amount of time that it took to make sure that um, because we had to relocate businesses and, and deal with that, it has been a lot. So when we're talking about some of those challenges, we have to figure out how we could hopefully become more efficient with that. And I think what also council member Arias mentioned, I think that we've, the city has done, at least in the last few years, a really good job now of doing more planning. And so I'm excited that the West area, which I also represent, um, finally ha has gotten some attention in the last few years where now we're planning for the future because there was a lot of leapfrog um, that happened. Uh, there's city and county still roads that are mixed and that has impacted the ability to put infrastructure because we hadn't planned accordingly. There's a lot of neighborhoods still in that area that don't have the basic infrastructure that I've been trying to prioritize um, as a council member. So we have a lot of issues in front of us that we'll have to um, wrestle with in, in the coming months. The other thing that I wanted to point out, and um, thank you for the copy that you guys gave us. I think it was Leadership Council on um, part of the housing element plan um, and program 27 where it talks about equitable communities. Because I know at least in the southern part of the city there are a number of those one of the things that um, is noted here was that um, we should be doing an annual report. And I think had we been doing that, we probably wouldn't be faced with what we're having to do today because we haven't been implementing what we put in place. And so what I hope that we take from this conversation is that as we do our review, that we also implement the rest of the general plan and do these annual reports so that we are not having to come, you know, four or five years later saying, hey, we need a whole, um, a whole revamping of a general plan when we haven't played close attention to what are the tools or resources necessary to make sure that we are being successful in implementing the goals of the general plan. So those are my comments um, with it. I don't have a problem with doing the review because I think that it's, it kind of tells us in this plan that we should have been doing it all along every year um, and that we should have done some type of committee, so I'm supportive of that. The only thing is I don't know if we need to um, dictate to have dollars attached to it at this point. I think it makes more sense that when we have the conversation in the budget, if this is something that we want to prioritize in the budget, that we then include um, we have that included in the budget six months from now. So that, that would be uh, my request uh, to revisit the, any allocation of, of funds. But I don't have a problem with a, with a review overall. In fact, I think that after the six month, we need to really stick to the annual, annual report. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, council members, and thank you for the input, uh, Councilman Sparza, and uh, those that represented um, the inner part of our city. I certainly understand support uh, the development in your areas. Um, unfortunately, at times, as the, especially with the expansion that took place 20 years ago, it, it moved rapidly, and we left uh, some parts behind. And clearly, 
uh, that needs to continue to be uh, dealt with, and I, I fully support that. At the same time, uh, we can't ignore the data. And when you're talking about 1,300 uh, permits uh, being pulled and the number just continuing to come down, something's amiss. Madera is building five to 6,000 homes in Madera. And why is that? Well, I think the free market speaks. I mean, people want to move to these homes. They want to be in these communities. They want single-family homes. And we can uh, kind of uh, ignore that, and we can ignore that, and we can say we're not going to grow. And that's what our general plan basically was, is that we're going to uh, not grow very uh, quickly, and we're going to move it in certain areas. But the free market will speak, and people will move uh, where they want to move, and the dollars talk. And when five to 6,000 people move to Madera or move to Clovis, they're paying property taxes in those areas, and we're not getting that property tax. The sales tax that they shop in neighborhood shops and other businesses that service those areas, that all moves in as well, and we've lost out on that. So we can uh, you know, put up our walls and say we're not going to grow, and it's all going to be just infill, and we're paying the price for it. And that's what's happening, and we ought to be reviewing this. Uh, we're not anywhere near what, what was projected. And so I commend my colleagues for saying, hey, we need to take a look at what's going on here. Uh, and I think we do. We also need to make sure that development pays for itself. That's always been an issue. It was in years back. And uh, we still want to continue to, to make sure that as we develop, uh, the development pays for itself. And I think there's been a lot of progress in that area. I think a lot of the development does, in fact, today pay for itself that it didn't pay 20 years ago. Um, but we can't ignore free market. We can't ignore that people want single-family homes. And if we do ignore it, we ignore it at our own peril. If we don't grow, communities stagnate. And those communities that continue to stagnate eventually really uh, get weak. And that's not something we want to have. So I commend uh, everybody for moving forward on this. I'm going to be uh, fully supportive of this and commit uh, uh, people who want to support this and work hard. And um, thank you uh, for, for the work that you're doing. All right, with that, uh, we have a motion uh, and a second. President Capriolio, I think it's time you punch up. Uh, let's, uh, you, the screen is clear, and you want to do electronic voting? Let's do electronic voting. Yes, supports the uh, action, and no is opposed. So can I ask a question? Councilmember Chavez, does the motion include the the amount, or is that going to be voted at a later time? Like, are we locking in to the two to three million dollars that is needed? No, no, absolutely not. Um, what we identified in there was having a funding source for whatever work needs to happen as a result of the general plan review committee. We we don't. If, if you're not comfortable with a specific amount, we can strike that out and replace it with just a funding source for whatever the committee can We would with. look, yeah. yeah. That would, I think that, I, that would we, work for me. That, that's acceptable. We can do that. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. We have a motion, uh, an amended motion and a second. And again, let's electronically vote. Council Member Arias, we're voting. You see how it is. Nice that you came back. Pass the seven zero. Thank you. Six one. Sorry, no vote. With uh, Esparza. Esparza. 